Good evening, a warm welcome to the Abbey Church of Dunfermline. I actually meant to be up here about an hour ago and I had posted that I would be up here about an hour ago, but unfortunately, um, phone calls and other things um, took over what I had to do today. It's hard to think that in lockdown, um, we would s th 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 I would still be as busy, but to be honest, um, I don't think I've not had a week when I've not had a few things to do and this week is one of those weeks when there's quite a lot happening um, and so actually I've come up this evening to do the tour I hope you I do hope you'll enjoy the tour in a wee minute and um, I've also come up to um, pre-record something for um, 11 o'clock tomorrow morning um, I'll be elsewhere at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning and then I'm also um, going to record our when bits of our Wednesday prayers, um, they, they should come out at midday. I am reliant on other people <laughs> and, uh, so that they'll appear at some point tomorrow. So as well as my not being here at four o'clock, um, the prayers will appear online tomorrow whenever they can. Um, and I hope that when they appear, um, there's something that worthwhile there for you to enjoy. It occurred to me while I was getting ready for this evening that some people might be hoping that at some point our tour might take you out into the 12th century nave and so I think it's probably worth my saying that at no point on my tour will we be heading out to the 12th century nave. For those who are not familiar with Dunfermline and particularly with Dunfermline Abbey, the Abbey Church is, um, the, well Dunfermline Abbey is, is um, cared for across three bodies. Um, the church, the part that we're in at the moment, um, is Church of Scotland and locally the Kirk Session is responsibility for the care of this building. So there are a number of elders who form the group of people who would care for this building, the congregation sharing that task as well. The 12th century nave, which is, um, I'll just turn this around a wee minute and I'll flick you back in a wee minute. So if I, t if I do this, so if you look up to the doors, they're up there. Um, it's interesting, I can see them, but you can't. Um, if you look up to the doors, 12th century nave is through that way, and um, the 12th century nave and the palace that lies over to the um, my left hand side of this, um, they are in the care of Historic Environment Scotland. And during lockdown, there are no staff here. Um, they're being cared for, the building's still being cared for, but um, there's no staff locally, and I suspect at one point one of their staff may pop up to say hello as well. And uh, yes, so there's no, I, I won't be in the 12th century nave, that's their building, and um, it would not be right for me to wander out there to do the tour. So our tour will really only be here. So the third party that's responsible for any part of Dunfermline Abbey is um, the graveyard, as with all graveyards in Scotland, are all active graveyards in Scotland, is owned by the council, and so they therefore um, care for the graveyard outside. Of course, there's lots of strange and bizarre anomalies that happen across all of that, but I thought it was worthwhile saying now that if you're hoping that you might get to see the 12th century nave, it's not going to happen because it's not our building and it's not for me to be wandering around in the nave. I might wander around outside depending on what Mary gives, you to t gives me to tell you about. But as I said from the beginning, these are not my words. Mary has kindly put together things that would, be, would have been part of a tour. Um, we usually open at the end of March, the beginning of April, for those who would like to come and visit our building other than during worship. And oh, that's not happened this year. So Mary has kindly put together a whole lot of different topics. And if you look back down our Facebook page, you'll find the two weeks on Bruce. I've had a wee look at the St. Margaret window, the Bruce window, the Tiffany window. And this week she has given me something. Oh, and I did the pulpit and the lectern as well. And this week she has given me the memorial chapel. So I'm standing here in the memorial chapel. You see the window behind me there. I'll just do a wee scoot around on the fat and I'll just turn you around. You're going to see odd things in the memorial chapel, I would imagine, because it's different things because we use this for prime time on a Sunday morning when we're meeting now. And prime time is our all age group. Um, who come and share worship together. So you're looking up, on that side, you're looking up the south side, the south aisle, and that grey box is where the Tiffany window is housed. And so I'm just gonna take you around. And this here is Memorial Chapel. Oh, one of the windows, we'll come back to talk about these windows in a wee minute. 
Um, keep wandering around. Communion table. Piece at the back. This window here. This window um, has been part of a few things recently. And yes, and then there's there's a television. <laughs> and there's this lectern too. Um, so let me have a wee look. I might move my stand so that you get a better view. Oh, we don't have a wee wander with me. We'll just wander up this way. I'll come up to the top here. It's not looking quite so much like where we abandoned it, but it does a wee bit, so here we go. Yes, you see the television screen is for prime time. It does look a bit odd sitting there. Maybe I should have moved it. I'll get a trouble. I'll get a row later. I'm sure Keith will tell me off that that I should have moved the television screen. Maybe you'll tell me off. You'll all tell me off. There's a whole host of congregation members who will probably stick a wee thing up saying, why didn't you move the television? <laughs> well, I didn't. <laughs> On the 16th of September 1947, the, minister, the then minister of the Abbey Church, the Reverend Robert Dollar, proposed that an area of the church be used to create a side chapel. This was to be used as a memorial chapel and the walls were lined with oak panelling and carved in the oak panelling was a plaque with the names of members of the congregation who died during the wars. I'll wander down to that in a wee minute. The idea of having a memorial area was received very well. All of the furniture with, now within the chapel is dedicated in memory of someone held dear. Each item, the carved woodwork behind the table, the wrought iron, which is just here. The table itself. And each of the chairs, so each of these chairs, has a plaque with a name on it. There are over 60 names on the chairs alone. And over the years, lots of people from home and abroad have found it comforting to sit in a chair commemorating a member of their family. One occasion springs to mind. A young lady from New Zealand visited the Abbey Church. She was sure that a member of her family was in some way commemorated in the Abbey. Her family from Dunfermline were with her, but were sure this wasn't the case. The young lady gave the name of the person and the place where he'd been killed in action, and to the complete surprise of those with her, she was correct. The details in the memorial book confirmed all that she had said, and he was also commemorated on the memorial, on the plaque in the memorial chapel. So I'm just going to wander back down here again, so you can have a look. I'll go. For, I'll, I'll show you the book elsewhere. It, it's not in the memorial chapel at the moment. We put it out especially um, in November for people. Yes, here is the plaque for all of those who died during, who were members of the congregation who died during the First and Second World Wars. So Mary then um, looks at some of the windows in the chapel. So she talks about the Livingston window so the east wall of the memorial chapel is the Livingston window and I purposefully have come down here because if I do it from well, I'll wander back up the back but if I do it from the back what happens is you get the the light in the way so let's see Maybe it's not too bad I'll wander back down so there's the window this window was gifted by Charles Edward Livingston, seedsman who unfortunately died before it was completed in 1937. The artist was Alexander Strachan and the subject matter is love and shows the acts of mercy as described in Matthew chapter 25 verses 35 to 36. The upper panels from the left to right read, I was hungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. The lower panels from left to right read, I was sick and you comforted me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to me. In the lights at the very top, 
can be seen on the left, the birth, the stork for birth, and on the right, the phoenix for rebirth, and the tree of life is in the centre. Do you know, doing this is always amazing because there's things that you didn't realise that you hadn't noticed, but yes, if you see, you can see them just above all of those. Now, all round about here, my, I, I don't think I can get far enough back to do this one any justice, really, but I'll do my best. This is the pool window. It's on the south side of the chapel, and it's designed by Ballantyne of Edinburgh in 1914. This window was the gift of Margaret Poole, who, having returned to her hometown of Dunfermline from America, gave the window in memory of her husband, William Poole, formerly a tailor in Dunfermline. As you see, that was, I said the light's going to get in the way, and that's going to be the issue on this one, I think. I'll do my best for you, but it's quite difficult. So you probably won't see the very upper tracery lights, but I'll do my best to hold that like that for you. The upper tracery lights symbolise the cardinal virtues. Love, joy, peace, meekness, faith, goodness, gentleness, temperance and long-suffering. The lower lights show three figures depicting faith, charity and hope, while the upper lights depict St Paul preaching with the text. He preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. At first glance, the window is not as colourful as some others in the church. But with a limited palette of colours, the artist very cleverly makes the figures advance and recede, as in medieval stained glass, using the tones of red, blue and silver. The subjects are within Gothic shrine work. A visiting artist commented that this intricately detailed work was some of the finest he had ever seen. So, now, I just flick out of that for a wee minute. So, you see my stand? Look, there's my stand. I just want to pop open my Facebook for a wee minute. Because actually, I was going to show you this um, lectern here. This lectern here is um, relatively new. And it, um, it's, it's terrible when you can't find what you're looking for. I was just going to show you this. Um, it's relatively new. It was um, gifted to the Abbey in 2016 um, by the Snedden family. And I suppose what I want to show you about it is the fact that the stand forms a beautiful fish shape. And then round this side, the, the wood is inlaid to represent the disciples. It's also inlaid as waves, so that there's lots of biblical stories in this. You have the, you have the fish, Ixus, you have the disciples, and then um, you have the waves as an opportunity to speak about the story of, of stilling the storm. And then the, even the top um, is beautifully carved, um, and it's, I have to say, it is actually designed to hold an iPad um, to make life easier for the minister. And the other thing I said I would show you was this memorial book. During the week, we keep this one here out for people to be able to use and see. And it allows people to have a wee look at those from the congregation who gave their lives during the Second World War. However, this is just a copy, and it was, it's so that people can flick through it easily. The real one is um, through this way. I'll just go for a wee wander. I hope I'm not making you dizzy. I'm sure I probably am. But the real one's through here. With, um, you've been, we've not really been through this curtain yet, but um, 
This is a lot of the Elgin family memorials. Who keeps noticing that I just, nobody else is here and I just leave things and I'll get into trouble eventually. Just don't tell Mary, that's all I'm saying. So, <laughs> for those who wanted to have an opportunity to have a closer look at this book, um, it was pre prepared by a, a member of this congregation and comes out specially during November so that people can have a good look at it. So that has all of the same details as the copy. The copy just allows for people to flick through it, but this one comes out in November. And then this one down here has come from um, the Airborne Alliance. Um, every April, usually, we welcome the Airborne Alliance for their annual muster, and they have left this book um, of the Roll of Honour from Afghanistan here for safekeeping as well. And should anybody wander in and want to see that, then they're able to do so. Not going to say much about what's in here. I'm sure many of you will recognise these as communion tokens. They come from a time when you were required to um, to bring a token to worship. You, will have, you would have fulfilled all of the requisites to mean that you were entitled to a place at communion and then you were given a token and then when you arrived at church you were then allowed to take your place um, at the table. What were the prerequisites? Um, you probably had to have been fairly well good, not ended up before the Kirk session, um, fairly well behaved and not ended up before the Kirk session. You may well have been able to recite your catechism and you may have been tested on um, some biblical books. And all of that was done by elders. Um, good shed. These days we don't do that. These days our Kirk session, our elders go out to visit uh, as friends, <laughs> chat with folk, find out how they are and all are welcome at the table. Um, I'm fairly sure that's a fairly good gospel principle. Um, other things to notice, this here was a gift um, from a moderator and then we have another gift from a moderatorial visit here this stone i'm sure if anybody knows anybody at flemington hillside it might be nice for them to know they're still here in our here in the abbey and we still remember them in prayer it's interesting i don't know that uh, i'm still i'm friends with neil i don't know that neil ever ever knew that his stone came here but his stone is here and uh, they are still part of the life of this church and we still remember that congregation I know that Neil's not at Flemington Hillside anymore and I think now th this this we do we do now sell these um, peace tartan scarves but uh, the um, this one was actually given by the by um the person who designed it and hands them out. He did that having Victor Spence having um, led the trip of the Dalai Lama. And so here is the scarf. Oh, the sun's shining too brightly. The white scarf in the middle there is the scarf that the Dalai Lama um, gave to the Abbey on his visit in 2004. That's eight years before I come. Um, so yes, that's there as well. Um, I don't know if there's some communion wear. If you're if a church historian, you'll know all about communion wear. Um, around here, still communion wear. There's something's missing. Now these are these are awards that uh, that uh, the Abbey has won. So the, the at some point in 1991 to 92, won the award for come and see Scotland's churches, and then in and I remember when this was, 2014, they um, won the Best Visitor Attraction and Fife Award, and we sent Mary Welsh to receive the award on our behalf. And I'm just going to you know, show you this. This is the original font. It's looking a little bit worse for wear. We have a smaller, easier to move one. It doesn't make this one not beautiful and not worthwhile. So just so you've seen that, it may become apparent why in the distant future, you never know. So I've shown you the Memorial Chapel, a place of memories and a showcase full of memories, an opportunity to think about times past 
and longed for hopes. I suppose standing in the memorial chapel is an opportunity to think about times gone by and longed for hopes. It's not November yet. I am this week preparing for some things for um, Armed Forces Day, which will take a different um, shape than it has in the past. Um, so I suppose I was having a wee think about this memorial here. These young men who went away with all of their memories and all of their hopes to change and challenge the world. And who didn't come home, but their hopes and their dreams were encapsulated by their families who wanted them to be remembered. And they won't just have been mem remembered in the carving of wood or on war memorials across the town. They'll have been carried in the lives of families who've allowed the memory of those young men to shape who they are and what they become and what they fight for. Certainly one of the names on that list um, I, I automatically recognise as somebody who's related, there's somebody within the congregation who relate, is related to one of those names. Uh, and, and I know that they still allow that story to shape their lives. Stories are, are powerfully important in shaping who we are and what we become. The, the people who have been part of our lives uh, are really very significant in, in how we choose to live our lives in the future. I said I was preparing for something else and so um, I'm going to in a wee moment disappear off and uh, record a memorial service. Uh, I think in this time when funerals can't be as they should be, it, it's really important to allow people space and time to be able to mull over why somebody was important and mattered to them to think about the love that was shared of the fun times that were had and also those moments when you fell out because they're equally as important in, in the shaping of who we are. It's important at the moment to make time for people to have those and that's partly why here in the Abbey when, when we can't, um, when everybody can't be at a funeral and but people still need to be allowed a space to say goodbye um, I'm trying to find time to record something for families um, that, that goes up so a family can share it with their friends and although the family will be at the funeral, the friends can still be part of something. It's important because it, it allows us to have an ending, to realise that life will change beyond that moment. But in the ending, we're not saying that someone no longer matters. Instead, we're saying that they mattered enough, that there are bits of what we have learnt from them that will shape who we are and what we do for our lives. Because in many ways, that's what we're doing in a funeral. Although we're bringing a period of, of loss to a climatic point, it's, it's a moment at which we are also recognising why that person mattered to us so that we can then make why they mattered to us shared in our life. It's an important part of, of all of our lives to notice why people matter and to then notice why, why we do things because they were part of our lives. And we might sometimes think that it's insignificant, that, that how we have shared life with another doesn't matter. But the way in which we grieve reminds us that it does. That we miss smiles. That we miss phone conversations. That we miss the irritating habit. They're constantly sticking your hands through your hair. The butting in when you should be quiet. And we miss them because they make us behave differently. As we go to butt into a conversation, I bet you sometimes think, oh, I'll not be like them. As we throw our hands through our hair and we're distracting other people, we think, oh, that's like so-and-so. When we're sore-faced and bringing people's lives down and we remember that somebody's smile 
change their life for those around about them. These seem like small and insignificant things, and yet they're hugely and vastly important. So it's thy kingdom come. It's a week in which, or 10 days in which we're marking in the passage of prayer from Ascension Day to Pentecost, and we're sharing that globally. So I wondered, how are you feeling? Are you up for sharing the Lord's Prayer together? Do you think we could say those words and remind ourselves that we are a community founded in the nature of God with love to be shared and hope to be lived? So let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.